Thank you for joining us today for our panel discussion entitled Lessons Learned and What's Next for Primary Care Transformation. My name is Claire Mulhern, and I'm the Chief Communications and Public Affairs Officer at Agilon Health, and I'll be your moderator for today's session. Our company's vision at Agilon is to transform healthcare in 100 plus communities across America by placing the primary care physician at the center of a holistic total care relationship with their senior patients. I will introduce our panel very shortly, um, but I do wanna tee up today's panel discussion before we get started. Today, we're gonna to discuss the evolution of primary care and value-based care payment models and what those models mean for physicians and their patients as we move into the future. We firmly believe, as does CMS and practices across the country, that primary care is essential to restructure the way healthcare is delivered at the local level and across the country. We need a new model of primary care that moves doctors off the fee-for-service treadmill and rewards them for the short and long-term health outcomes they deliver for their patients. The current fee-for-service model that many PCPs operate in is fundamentally broken, leading to healthcare that is fragmented, under-coordinated, and unsustainably expensive. And we're gonna discuss these issues facing practices today. We're also gonna talk about what lessons our esteemed panel has learned from operating in various value-based care models, including full risk Medicare Advantage and ACO Reach, for example, why health equity is so critical to the equation, including the need to focus on provider inequities, which we had a great discussion as, as we were prepping for this panel, and what we see as the future of primary care transformation including the integration with specialty care. So with that long introduction, I really wanna turn next to you to introduce our distinguished panel of all women physicians. This is one of the things that's really excited me about today's discussion. We've got a full female panel. First and foremost, I'd like to introduce you to Dr. Dora Hughes. I know many of you already know her. She's the Chief Medical Officer at the CMS Innovation Center at the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services. Next, I'd like to introduce you to Dr. Aileen Nicky, who's the president of the Maine Health Medical Group, the largest multi-specialty medical group in Northern New England. Next, Dr. De Janeiro, who's a practicing family medicine physician and president of Pioneer Physicians Network in Akron, Ohio. And of course, last but not least, Dr. Jan Frolick, who's the president of PrimeMed Physicians, a 50 provider primary care medical group in Dayton, Ohio. So ladies, let's dive into our discussion today. Um, I'm gonna start by asking our panelists to kind of set the stage as we talk about primary care transformation. Where is the landscape today? And um, of course, there's no better place to start than with Dr. Hughes. Um, Dr. Hughes, could you kind of describe to us the primary care transformation that you're seeing from the landscape um, from CMI's perspective? Um, would really kind of love for you to kind of set our tone for our discussion today, and then we'll have our other panelists dive in and, and contribute. Sure, and I just want to start by thanking you for inviting me to join uh, this panel today. This is such a critical issue, uh, and is it certainly is a priority for the CMS Innovation Center. Um, just to set the stage a little bit, when we look at our across our Medicare beneficiaries, uh, about 70% of our Medicare beneficiaries have two or more chronic conditions, and nearly 20%, one in five, have six or more chronic conditions. Uh, when we also look at, uh, across these beneficiaries, 30% of our beneficiaries report seeing five or more physicians uh, every year, and they are struggling to effectively manage their care. Uh, and from the provider perspective, the statistics are, in many cases, equally startling. Uh, there has just been a dramatic increase in the number of physicians that a primary care provider has to coordinate with on behalf of their patients. Uh, this rose from 52 physicians uh, in 2000 to 95 physicians in 2019, which is an 83% increase. And so for us, this means our Medicare beneficiaries, besides having to coordinate struggle to manage their care, they're often also receiving unnecessary and duplicative services and often with uh, higher out-of-pocket costs than they would otherwise uh, incur. And fundamentally, um, there's no one provider that's truly accountable for the 
quality of care and the total cost of care uh, for their patients. And so certainly we very much agree with you. Uh, we see primary care as uh, just playing a vital role in the health system. Uh, we often quote uh, the National Academies report. They uh, describe primary care as is the foundation, uh, high quality primary care is the foundation of the healthcare system. Uh, it's associated with improved quality, lower mortality, and lower healthcare costs, uh, and improved equity. Uh, and so for us here at the Innovations, at CMS Innovation Center, if I could turn to our own work, um, to date we have invested in three primary care models, comprehensive primary care, comp or CPC, uh, comprehensive Primary Care Plus, or CPC Plus, uh, and Primary Care First, which is uh, currently underway right now. Uh, and for our first two models, CPC and CPC Plus, uh, both of which have concluded, uh, we really were through these models hoping to improve the quality and efficiency of care and access to primary care. Um, the practices that participated in these models uh, made meaningful changes in the way they delivered care centered on key comprehensive primary care functions. Uh, and the five areas, uh, access and continuity, care management, comprehensiveness and coordination, importantly, patient and caregiver engagement, uh, and planned care and population health. Uh, and importantly, as you noted, trying to move from fee-for-service, the volume of care provided, uh, both CPC, CPC Plus, they did uh, provide a uh, payment innovation, uh, CPC Plus provided both care management fees, performance-based incentive payments, as well as uh, the tr more traditional payment under the Medicare physician fee schedule. Um, so what did we learn? I'll just speak briefly from CPC and CPC Plus, uh, our first models, we learned that primary care practices can indeed meaningfully change how they organize and deliver care and these value-based arrangements. Uh, even practices with pretty limited prior experience uh, were able to make the needed changes to advance um, uh, delivery of primary care. Uh, but that being said, very candidly with our earlier primary care models, the quality and total cost of care impacts were modest, sometimes not significant, uh, and they were certainly challenging to detect in a five-year period. Uh, and then another issue, uh, equity was not often a, a direct aim for these models. Blacks and Latinos uh, were underrepresented in these earlier two models. Um, so with primary care first, that's underway now, and future models, uh, we've been thinking about how do we build upon what we've learned? How do we test how we can provide better support for the advanced primary care capabilities that will lead to higher quality and reduced cost of care? Um, so we're certainly very excited. We will continue to invest in these areas. We've signaled publicly uh, that we were that we are working on another primary care model. Uh, I think that uh, for us, we very much value hearing the experiences of providers, leaders on the on the ground in the field who are actually doing this work. And so I'm quite excited uh, to hear the discussion of our panel and to hear from my co-panelists on this topic. So I will turn the mic back to you, Claire. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Hughes. And, um, you know, we're going to have a robust discussion on health equity later because this is definitely a critically important topic. But I, I, I loved that you said that it primary care is the foundation. And that kind of leads to, you know, really like to have Dr. Mickey, Dr. DeGenero, Dr. Froelich speak. Um, you know, each of them are in a different stage in their journey and the transition to value and what this means for their organization. But the common ground is, is that primary care is critical to how this is doing it, and primary care is a priority at the organization, particularly Dr. DiGino and Dr. Prolick, who are independent primary care practices. Um, would love each of you to kind of comment, um, you know, on, you know, describe your participation in the primary care transformation, you know, where you guys are seeing this kind of going today from your perspective, um, you know, to Dr. Hughes' per point on you're on the ground, you're delivering this, you're, you're, your physicians are dealing with patients, you yourself are, and, and would love to hear. Maybe Dr. Mickey, we can speak, start with you. Sure, thank you. Um, yes, it, we, we've been very anxious at Maine Health. So Maine Health Medical Group is quite large. We have about a thousand physicians and then APP. So altogether our providers are about 1700, spread over 220 practices in Maine and New Hampshire. Um, so quite a scope for a health system to manage. And, and it's very 
a very different practice than independent uh, practices. And, and I have a background in practicing as a specialist in um, independent practice and private practice. So very, very different model. And we have struggled um, for years with having that one foot in each canoe, right, is being driven by our fee-for-service revenue, particularly because in a health system, you also have hospitals. So it's not just ambulatory. You're not just looking at your practices. You're also looking at hospital revenue. So what it sets up is an inherent conflict within a health system where you want appropriate utilization of your ED, of your surgical services, appropriate um, procedures. However, when you admit people and you send them to the ED or your urgent cares, you get paid for that in a fee-for-service world. So how do you manage that as a health system is one of the struggles that I think a lot of the larger health systems are facing. But ultimately, I mean, our vision at Maine Health is working together so our communities are the healthiest in America. And in order to do that, we have to have appropriate high quality care. And that does result in decreased utilizations for some of our hospital services. And, and we view that as a positive thing. So how do you get one foot both feet in the same canoe of value-based reimbursement um, because we've been doing it in pieces. So we participated in Primary Care Plus and Primary Care First. We have pay-for-performance contracts with several different commercial payers. So it's kind of a mishmash of things. And so you're trying to do both at the same time. And what happens with your primary care physicians is that now they're, they're being told, well, you have to see more patients and continue to see patients because we're living in a fee-for-service world but you also have to meet all these quality metrics and outcome metrics. And so, you know, we're giving them um, uh, different messages and, and different themes. And really, we felt the only way to get over that hump is to take a leap um, with a large part of our population and say, we're going to, to put our nickel down, we're going to go for value-based reimbursement. So um, that uh, led us to the partnership with Agilon Health to take our uh, about 40,000 Medicare Advantage lives and put them into um, a, a value-based arrangement. And I think we're just entering into it now. We spent a year really prepping. Our contracts are, are coming um, now in January, 2023. But what I see with primary care is it's a lot of work, but there's a light at the end of the tunnel to say, if we do this correctly, we can create a different kind of revenue stream with value-based reimbursement that we can feed back into primary care and then develop additional resources to fund things that in a traditional health system would be put to the side. Things like palliative care, which we know decreases end of life utilization and, and inappropriate utilization of care, um, but doesn't have a technically a financial ROI and a fee-for-service system. But if we can develop this, this um, value-based reimbursement stream that we can feed back in, we can support services like that. We can also support our primary care physicians who are spending a lot of time on the phone with a patient, fielding portal messages, doing other care that's appropriate and incredibly important, but it's not tied to RVUs or a CPT code because the patient isn't coming in for a visit, but it's still appropriate care and, the, and we can't reimburse it in a fee-for-service system. So I've seen a lot of enthusiasm to say, yes, this is the way we need to go. And this is kind of our year last year and this year is getting over that hump to try to get into significant value-based reimbursement with then plan to expand that. Yeah. That, that's great. And I love this concept of a, a foot in each canoe. Uh, I, I saw some nodding on the the, the line here as, as you said that. Um, Dr. DeGeneres, maybe I can turn to you. I know you guys have been operating in value for some time, and maybe you can kind of share where you're viewing it today, and then and Dr. Froelich will, will go to you next. Yes, yes, thank you. Thank you for having me today. So I'm the president of Pioneer Physicians Network. We are a, about 60 physician, uh, completely independent primary care practice based around Akron, Ohio. We have um, three different counties supported and about 23,000 total me Medicare lives. We have gone on the value-based train for a while. We've been really trying to shift all of our um, all of our business towards that. We started with Medicare Advantage. We're going into year five with a full risk contract that we have partnered with Agilon Health for. And then we are also participating in ACO Reach now for our Medicare fee for service. And 
it's revolutionary in the care we can provide and how far we have come. You know, when you're on the fee for service, we call it the squeaky hamster wheel. You, you have to see more patients and it's so loud and you don't know what's going on. And we know that that is not sustainable for both patients as well as physicians. The burnout rate alone in, in medicine can attest to that. And it's not necessarily good care. So by doing this, we have been able to provide better quality care to our patients through care management. We have an entire team now of care coordinators, RNs, social workers that help provide that comprehensive care, whether that's a home visit, whether that's arranging follow-up, um, you know, medication management, all the different things that they may need help with. And we also allow our PCPs now to have more time with their patients. A lot of our PCPs have transitioned to minimum 30-minute appointments with all of your high-risk older patients because they need that time. And in the past, you didn't have that time because you had to run the squeaky hamster wheel. And now you can get off of it and provide the care that you need. And I have seen it in my own practice. A really quick example of that is that I have a really sweet 90-year-old patient with a lot of medical issues who came in for neck pain. And it turns out, you know, she had broken her dens, which is the bone in your neck that hangs someone. But she was completely talking to me, walking, independent, just had neck pain, which is incredible in itself. But that traditionally would have resulted in an ER visit, probably a hospitalization, a very expensive surgery. With the resources that I have in my, my hands now, I'm able to call my care manager, who is able to call a tier one orthopedic specialist, which we'll get into like the specialists later, but so valuable that you have good specialty care to support primary care, gets that patient in the next day, gets all the care they need, brace, PT, pain control, and was able to avoid all of the complications that could come with a hospitalization and a surgery. I would have never had the resources or time or capacity to do that prior to value-based care. And now I, I can tell you that a year later she did great and she had a much better quality of life. So truly this is transformational. Yeah. Now that's great, Jan, why, uh, Dr. Perlick, why don't we turn it over to you um, you know, I think quality is the name of the game here in terms of what we're really trying to achieve. Correct. Yeah. So um, I'm with Prime Med Physicians, the president of Prime Med Physicians, and, and uh, we are a 4550 provider practice in a uh, practice group in Dayton, Ohio area. Um, we uh, are family practice and pediatricians and in our adult population. We care for about 8,000 Medicare lives, um, a majority being Medicare Advantage. And we do also do the direct contracting ACO uh, reach now. Um, PrimeMed has been really part of this practice transformation since 1995 where we with our evolution and we started with fee for service and and like Vicky described you know I I always think of an example of a fracture where in the old days people would become you know they would have an injury they would go to an emergency room you know almost universally admitted for expensive surgical procedures and then released to their homes with really inappropriate follow up if if any follow up at all but through our evolutions, and we've gone through the CPC, um, CPCI, CPC Plus, um, even to value-based contracting, and now we're looking at a full-risk contracting, we need to be more comprehensive in our care. And so in that same person now, what we're looking at is, you know, making sure that people are asking the question of, why did you have your fracture? Is your home safe to go uh, to? Do you have underlying conditions that create these problems? You know, do you have nutrition to heal your fracture? Do you have um, the equipment that you need in your home to make sure that you recover and can uh, return to a healthy uh, life? So it really is bigger and better than the care that we used to deliver. And what, what makes it even more valuable is that it is really fulfilling from both, uh, both a uh, patient perspective and physician perspective and, and gets back to the heart of what primary care really should be. Yeah, no, that's great. And we talk a lot too about you know, this is really allowing physicians to be the doctors that they were trained to be. Um, I'm, you know, I'm not obviously a, a physician, but I, in speaking with all of you for, for many times, just hearing the impact that you'll be able to have on patient and really getting back to your roots in terms of delivering that high quality care, I think is so critical. Um, we started to get into this a little bit in terms of lessons learned. Dr. Hughes, you kind of talked about, you know, with the previous models, you've learned a lot. You know, I want to dive into next is kind of what are we really seeing is even further about the impact of these new payment models. You know, maybe I can ask each of you to kind of share what is that the biggest lesson that you've learned 
um, as you've been kind of doing this. And again, I know Dr. Mickey, Maine Health is really just kind of starting to dive into this. So Dr. Hughes, again, let's start with you. You know, what would you say would be the top main lesson or two lessons that CMMI or the Innovation Health Center has kind of learned over this last decade of healthcare transformation? Uh, sure, and this is uh, such a timely uh, question. Uh, uh, last year, uh, in 2022, uh, we won our research and evaluation group. They uh, looked across all of our portfolio of models to think through what are some of the main uh, lessons that we've learned from our first 10 uh, years in existence. And they were able to synthesize the results from about 21 different models uh, that uh, I can just discuss very briefly. Um, first, and I think this is a question people always want to know, but about half the models, more than half of the models, they did demonstrate savings to Medicare. So through the efforts just described uh, in this value-based uh, arrangement arena, we did see uh, gross savings. Um, and most of the savings, frankly, were driven by reductions in inpatient admissions, readmissions, post-acute care, more on the acute, uh, acute care, the episodic care, especially care. Uh, and that's, a, that's an important issue because uh, it's a bit of a mixed picture. If we have models that are focused on the acute care, especially care, uh, they were more likely to show gross savings and generally had uh, larger impacts on utilization. And these findings contrasted with the findings for our primary care and population management models, uh, which generally served uh, healthier populations. They focused on preventing disease, improving care coordination. These models were less likely to show gross savings. Uh, and so the kind of the thinking for us is that for our primary care models, maybe we needed to have a longer time window for investments in primary care care coordination, staffing, clinical workflow redesign, all these in and of themselves are very hard to do. And they also probably need a longer time period for us to uh, be able to demonstrate the full benefit uh, as well as the cost savings. And that's certainly informing uh, some of our uh, thinking uh, moving forward. And I'll just say a quick note on primary care first, that's our newest primary care model. We do have some uh, early lessons that I think very much align with what I've heard, um, what we've heard from uh, the uh, my colleagues on this panel today. And those participants, they have reported that we are back to basics. We're working on building relationships with our patients. And they report that they are able to do this in part because of the steady, the predictable population-based payments that have allowed them to spend more time caring for their patients in ways that are generally not reimbursable uh, through Medicare fee-for-service. And then we're also seeing some uh, good performance on some of the uh, e, uh, CQMs, uh, whether that's uh, diabetes control, blood pressure, cold, colorectal cancer screening. So I'll stop there, but those are the, some of the key lessons, again, as we're thinking more about primary care, our population-based uh, models that uh, we have to think through how are we measuring uh, the savings, What's the time period for the some of the infrastructure uh, activities, the care design um, that uh, if we're going to really have a good picture of uh, the success of the models narrowly, but some of the broader transformational efforts. So I don't know if that means that we want to get more into the canoe or more on the train. I love some <laughs> of the analogies used previously, but uh, but certainly uh, we are very much aligned in, in where we'd like to go uh, with some of this work. Yeah, we can have analogies probably till the cows come home. There's another one for you. Um, <laughs> but uh, no, I really loved what you said, uh, Dr. Hughes, like particularly as we think about primary care, we talk about this a lot. It is prevention. It is the long term that you have to look at. And so, you know, I, I love the fact that CMMI is considering how do we look at this in terms of a model for, for longer term? Maybe it, it needs to extend beyond the five years in terms of how we look at the outcomes that we can drive. Um, you know, uh, maybe I'll turn back to, uh, to Dr. Mickey. Um, you know, you got into this a little bit in terms of, you know, as a health system, why is Maine wanting to move into value? But maybe you could kind of share what is the biggest lesson learned that as you've gone through the kind of this process of getting the health system ready to really dive into this? What, what have you learned and, and what would you take away as you, you think about the, the next, you know, 20, 30 years as you continue in this journey? Yeah, well, I, I think the most important thing is to be aligned in terms of your higher level leadership that this is the right thing to do. 
Absolutely, right? We have a CEO and an executive team who is behind this, who understands why we needed uh, to move into value-based reimbursement and also understands that primary care is the foundation and, and without it, we are not going to be successful. And I think that's the most important thing for any health system because if you're not dedicated to this, it's very hard work and it takes a long time. There's a transition period, there's risk, there's upheaval, quite frankly, um, and there's the inherent conflict that I discussed before when you also own hospitals. So you have to be incredibly committed and have that commitment to the very top of the organization. And we have that at Maine Health, which, is, which makes things so much easier, but I, it, you have to have it. I think the second piece is you have to show primary care physicians and care teams the light at the end of the tunnel. You have to focus on that big picture because their daily work right now as we're going through this transition is probably harder than it was when we started. We're asking more of them right now, um, but for a good reason. And, and if you don't keep that in front of folks, that big picture, the vision of what you're trying to achieve, it can get overwhelming with the day-to-day and to that end, I think really what's most important is your care team, right? Do you have a care team model? This cannot all be on the backs of one physician taking care of their patients, right? How do you partner physicians and APPs? How do you have RNs, care management, MAs, that whole team to share the burden and share the work? And then how do you provide upfront resources as you're doing this work um, so that they, they are seeing a benefit immediately? and not having to wait six months or a year to really see any benefit when you start reaping the benefits from a financial standpoint for value-based reimbursement. So I would say it's really organizational dedication, it's paying attention to the care team, and it's making sure you're providing upfront resources as initially you're asking folks to do more work, meaning we're turning everything upside down on its head and changing workflows in the way we do things. And that takes resources and it takes time and commitment. Yeah, you're, you're changing a mindset um, and, and for good reason um, to deliver quality and, and, and important um, experience for your providers as well. Um, maybe Dr. Froelich, we can turn to you next. And um, Dr. Dujanar, we'll go to you last, recognizing that you guys have been kind of cooperating in value for the longest, but we'd love to hear your perspective, Dr. Froelich, in terms of what is that main lesson that you guys have learned and how are you applying it? Yeah, so two two big lessons that I think that we've taken in, and the first has already been suggested by Dr. Mickey, and that is it does, it takes a team. And, and that team includes everybody from the, the person who answers the phone, who checks in, checks out, the staff that's with you is right by your side in the office, um, and then your, your pop health and your care teams that are there, there to support you. Um, and then in our organization, being a smaller independent primary care organization, it takes a community team. So engaging your, your specialist in your community, making sure that they understand that, that their value um, but that they need to bring a particular type of care to your patients, that your patients deserve that, uh, that degree of care. Um, and so that team needs to be inclusive. And, it, it, when, and when we refer to our patients, we really strive to talk about our patients and not Dr. Froelich's patient or even not even the prime med Beaver Creek patient, but, but our patients. And so everybody has ownership in that. And then the second big lesson, I believe, is, is patient first. And so remembering that the patient is really the reason for the team. And so often we develop all of these wonderful systems and teams and care teams, but someone forgets to share that with the patient. And so making sure that you engage the patient and they understand that this isn't the same old health care that they used to do. This is not about paying, you know, a copay or a certain dollar sign and coming in and getting, you know, 15 minutes of, of care and then they leave, that, that we really want to stay engaged with them. And that healthcare needs that they need to be a part of that healthcare within your office, but also as they go home. And that care also needs to involve their family. That we have their family engaged. So if the if the uh, the patient is understanding the message, but the family doesn't, and ends up taking them to the emergency room or into the hospital for unnecessary care, that that we that that's not the way that we operate. Um, so remembering to communicate with the patient that the patient is the, the the main reason for it, and to be communicating with that patient. And so healthcare doesn't happen to the patient. Patient, that they're actually leading their own care. Yeah, that's great. And I, I think you talked about the mind shifts, um, mindset shift for the provider, but it's also for the patient as well and their family and, and, and what that means for them. So that's Dr. Right. Janeiro, we'd love to hear, you know, obviously you guys have been operating kind of a full risk model for five years. So we'd love to hear your perspectives. I know there's a lot of lessons. <laughs> 
I think the biggest lesson is the one that echoes what Dr. Mickey and Dr. Froelich just said, and it's the value of primary care. And, you know, we really believe our philosophy is that the most important thing in healthcare revol revolves around that relationship between, between a patient and their primary care team. And, and that translates into what happens because we see patients for 10, 20, sometimes 30 years, you build that relationship and they learn to trust you and you have to understand the responsibility of that, but then help guide them through this new system. We've already seen success by doing that. I mean, both financially, but also from the perspective of we've had decreased hospitalization and observations. And so we can show that when we invest in primary care, we get outcomes. And now we need to translate that across the board to all of healthcare. And I think it's not just in our Medicare population, we're actually taking that commercially as well, because that's the future of healthcare. Yeah. And I, I think that's an important point that you just raised, Dr. DeGenero, is when we bring this into a practice to apply it to your Medicare patients, the whole practice and all the patients within the practice benefit, because you're setting this up to actually impact the way the practice operates, regardless if it's Medicare patient or commercial patient, et cetera. So I think that's a really important point. Um, and also, I loved the point about the fact that it's that longevity of the patient-physician relationship or care team relationship. And that gets back to, you know, what Dr. Hughes kind of said at the beginning in terms of, you know, pr primary care is about prevention. It's that long term that you need to look at. Um, why don't we shift gears? Because, you know, we want to get to a discussion on health equity. We have one of our preeminent experts in health equity with Dr. Hughes on the line here. Um, and I think you kind of touched on in the beginning, Dr. Hughes, that you know, some of the previous models, health equity was not necessarily present, and, and this has really become present in the, in the strategy that CMS and CMI, CMMI is rolling out, um, would really like to understand, um, you know, and, you know, can you talk about why this is really coming to the forefront, particularly from a primary care model perspective, and, you know, your leadership in this area has been critical, so would really love to hear your perspective on this. Uh, yes, and we, we certainly are very excited about uh, the work that we uh, are starting to do on, on health equity. Uh, as part of our strategy, we have four areas of focus that I'll mention briefly. Uh, the first for our new models especially, but the, also for older models that have at least three plus years, how do we embed equity? And I'll talk a little bit more about that and the design. Um, the second area is we also realize that many of our of our earlier models, the beneficiaries we were served were, were not fully diverse. It didn't represent the full uh, diversity of beneficiaries in our Medicare Medicaid program. So how do we increase the diversity of beneficiaries served? And key to that uh, is how do we increase the number of safety net providers that are participating in our models? Uh, the third area is really focusing on a robust evaluation design so we can assess the health equity impact. Uh, and the fourth area is increasing data uh, across uh, socio-demographic populations. And when we can, uh, by pay, uh, for uh, uh, populations that are experiencing social needs or SDOH. So those are the four areas. With respect to the first area, and I think that certainly has relevance for our conversation right now, some of the questions we're asking ourselves for new models, what are the care delivery elements Who's on, the, who's on the care team? Uh, what's the financing? Not just the level of funding that's needed uh, to allow success, but also what is the timing? Are these upfront payments? What's the structure? We've uh, proposed testing, whether that's benchmark adjustments or if it's uh, cooperative funding. I mean, really looking at the, the types of funding. We're, we're, all of this is part of the, the test, both the care delivery requirements, the benefits, the services, the care team, uh, as well as the financing. So we're pretty excited and we're certainly taking a whole lifespan approach from model conceptualization all the way to sustainability at the end. How do we think about equity? And a final thing I would say in terms of including more safety net providers uh, as one strategy to increase the number of underserved beneficiaries in our models, we have a whole uh, you know, additional set of questions. Um, who are we recruiting? How are we engaging safety net providers? We haven't had done that as, as successfully in, in prior uh, models as we might have. Uh, what are the supports that they will need to get through the application process? What are the learning systems? 
uh, again, how do we think about assumption of risk for safety net providers that have such slim margins? Um, so all of that, we've had a couple of roundtables to really think through uh, all these uh, various issues, including how do you define a safety net provider? So we, we certainly have gone back to basics, um, but we are excited about some of the steps we've already announced through ACO Reach is one example. And certainly in our primary care context, uh, you will continue to hear more about uh, the equity considerations that um, that we are undertaking and that we expect our partnerships and our participants to undertake as well. That's great. Um, you know, as we talked about at the beginning of this, and thank you so much for health equity is so critical to everything that we need to do. In our kind of discussion and prep for this session, um, we also talked about not only as we think about the impact on the patient and, and how we look at it from medically underserved communities, but also we talked about inequities from a provider perspective. Um, you know, on this call, I, I'm, I'm happy to share, we, you know, Agilon has started a Women Physician Leadership Council, which is all focused on really raising up women physicians in leadership roles and helping to kind of build that next generation of female PCPs. And um, Dr. DeGenero and Dr. Froelich are part of that initiative to really kind of focus on those inequities for providers as well, which can also influence what that means for the patient. And so, Dr. DeGenero, I didn't know, I'd love to kind of hear your perspective uh, on that. And, you know, Dr. Froelich and Dr. Mickey, please feel free to chime in as well. Yes, absolutely. I think the issue that comes to mind with physicians and providers is multifactorial, but the first one becomes this idea of you know, inequity and in how we compensate. And so, and that translates then into practice down the line. There was a recent study by Doximity in 2021 that showed the gender wage gap between men and women physicians was 28%. And this is for an apples to apples comparison. So that's ridiculous. Like, why are we in this time and having that wage gap? However, within Agilon, we were able to show that with value-based care compensation, that wage gap goes to less than 6%. And the reason for this in a lot of ways is that women tend to be better at primary care. There have been studies that show women have lower morbidity and mortality and not just within Agilon, but published in JAMA and The Lancet. And so not to say men aren't well, like I think we need to raise everybody, but the point is we need to compensate our providers appropriately so that they can then have that capacity to care for patients. Because this also translates into patient access, which becomes an equity issue. You know, one other study has shown that within six years of completing residency, women physicians 40% either go part time or leave healthcare completely. And that becomes an issue of where are the primary care providers and doctors and, you know, everybody on the team to care for these patients. Like we don't have that access. So again, value-based care can solve a lot of those problems because a lot of the issue becomes burnout. And if we have more time to care for patients, less patients in a day, and you can dedicate those resources, it really can translates to revol like revolutionary care for the whole system. So I think the answer to gender inequity in medicine is value-based care. And I also think the answer to access in medicine becomes that as well. Dr. Froelich, Dr. Mickey, would love for you guys to, to chime in and with your thoughts as well. No, so I, we, of course, echo everything that, that uh, Dr. DiGennaro is saying is that um, the, the, the value um, that women bring to primary care and specialty care, but particularly in the primary care realm, is that it really is about identifying and really um, being maternal with the social determinants of health and being able to essentially become part of their, their health care family um, a little bit more effectively than some of the, uh, the male um, colleagues in the past. And, and the unfortunate truth is that, that they have not been able to be compensated for that because that takes time. So utilizing the system where we are allowed to have that time, both men and women, that, that we can foster those relationships and actually be, be at least uh, equal, if not even excel in those uh, relationships, both financially and actually emotionally. Yeah, and, and I would add from a leadership per, uh, perspective, this also plays into that, because if you look at higher level leadership in healthcare systems, it's still predominantly men. And one of the things that I've noticed is when I sit in a room with my colleagues, um, my male colleagues in similar leadership positions are eight to 10 years younger than I am. 
And when you look back at why that happens, um, it goes back to some of the things we were talking about, which is women have a ten- female physicians have a tendency to cut back, to work part time for different reasons. And because of that, they're viewed as less valuable members of the team and they're not identified for leadership potential or positions, quite frankly, and we still see that today. And so the repercussions of that are that they're not identified for potential until they, um, uh, for whatever reason, go back up to full time and start going through the process. We're missing such few, you know, such potential in future female leaders by doing that. And so one of my um, projects at Maine Health, and I'm joined by other female um, physicians who are very dedicated to this, is to, to change that, to start identifying um, female physicians early who are interested in leadership, and to also uh, remove the stigma of working a less than a 1.0 FTE, right? That doesn't mean that you are not a valuable part of the team. And um, it also represents, I I think, another issue in healthcare now, which is um, we've been inflexible for a very long time. We do healthcare one way, one way only. These are the rules and those have to change. And I think COVID has pushed us a lot faster than we would have changed. So let's use that and leverage it um, to move even faster. And, and this Dr. is why Mickey, I was so, oh, go ahead, Dr. Dijer. Well, no, I was just going to say, Dr. Mickey, I, I mean, I can't agree with you more. I think that was one of the tenets of why we founded our leadership council was that a lot of us, like, you know, I would go in a room and I'm the only woman in the room and it's, you know, it's just not, but yet half of the people coming out of medical school are women. So we do have to sponsor each other and we do need to, you know, change the rules. We always, my my friend, Dr. Williams and I always say, you can't change the game unless you're playing the game. So we have to get a seat at the table and then change how it goes. And I just have to tell you, it's wonderful to be on this panel today and see such fellow strong women physicians and leaders. Thank you for that. Yeah, and that, that was actually going to be my comment and so proud that we have so many incredible women leader, women physicians on this panel today. So I do want to save some time for us to have kind of a, a wrap up discussion on what we see as the future. We've talked about kind of where we are today, the lessons learned, why health equity from the patient lens as well as the provider lens is so important. But we would not end this conversation if we didn't talk about what we see as kind of the future need of where we need to focus. Um, We had a lot of discussion about the kind of the integration of primary care and specialty care as we were preparing for this panel. And Dr. Hughes would love to have you be able to kind of talk about that because obviously CMMI is looking at pioneering potentially some models that will create some greater integration there. So if you could set the stage, that would be great. Uh, Sure. Um, In addition to focusing on health equity, which is uh, a key, just a key top priority, Uh, Another key issue that we're thinking about uh, relevant to this conversation is how can we better enhance the primary care specialty care integration? What does that look look like from a patient perspective as well as a provider's perspective? What does that look like from a technological perspective, from a coding and payment perspective? All of that can get pretty complex pretty quickly. uh, And that's an area of fairly intense uh, focus for us here. Uh, As some of you may have seen, we released our specialty uh, integration uh, strategy through a blog uh, in November of last year on our website. And I would encourage those that want to see all the details uh, that they will be able to find them there. But I wanted to to mention today at least two short-term actions that uh, we've signaled that we may pursue that, again, are particularly relevant for our primary care models. Uh, The first is Uh, and we've heard this from so many of our participants, is that we really need to enhance transparency uh, by providing specialty care performance data and dashboards uh, to our primary care model participants. So that they have the ability to compare the quality and the cost of care of potential uh, specialist uh, partners. uh, And then they just generally have better information on the specialist performance. So that uh, enhancing transparency is as one of the key actions that uh, I expect we'll be undertaking in the days ahead. And the second, more in the shorter term uh, action that I would mention is that we're exploring the use of e-consults and enhanced referrals uh, in our advanced primary care models uh, to improve access to specialty care and uh, hopefully reduce the wait times for specialty visits as well. So between the two, better information, really thinking about e-consults, e-referrals, 
uh, that we're hoping to uh, move pretty quickly on specialty primary care integration uh, in, our, um, in our upcoming primary care uh, proposals. That's great. No, this is such a critical topic to talk about. And I love Dr. Mickey and Dr. Vigenero and Dr. Frola to kind of comment from their perspective of how this is happening you know, in their communities and the impact on patients. We have about two minutes left or three minutes left of our panel. Um, so, you know, maybe we can do a little bit of a lightning round um, and then we'll be able to close out for today. So Dr. Froelich, do you want to go first? Yeah, so name of the game is collaboration. So keeping communications open and, and doing that with the, as much uh, data and, and being factual um, and not just going with your gut on who to refer to, but being very, very collaborative with everyone, keeping the patient in mind. And I would, I would echo that in the sense of focusing on the healthcare ecosystem. We've talked a lot about primary care, and that's very important, but we can't do it without good specialty care as well. And with the models that we have in place now, we can see who is high value, low cost, and that is changing our referral patterns. And we're doing that in our own community. We've actually had meetings with those specialists to say, here's what we need you to do to take better care of our patients. So 100% collaboration and an ecosystem for all. Yeah. And Vicki, I know, um, Dr. Dujanero, I know what we're close on time, but would love for you to just kind of comment on, I know you brought all of your specialists together in the market to kind of have a conversation on that. I didn't know if you could comment on that a little bit. Absolutely. We had a meeting in the fall where we basically invited, I think, 100 different specialists to come and say, this is what we're doing with value-based care, and this is how we want you to be a part of it. And traditionally, like Dr. Froelich said, we have referred to you in the past, and we want to keep doing that, but we need you to meet certain measures. And we actually can see real time, you know, who has high readmissions for surgeries or complication rates or things like that. And it was really it was really like enlightening to be in the room with them and, and they were on board and they want to do this too, because it's the right thing for the patient and it's the right thing for healthcare. So again, it's just building that ecosystem. Okay. So Dr. Mickey, we'll end with you in terms of your comment on specialty care and the integration of private care in the future. Yeah, so so we have a large multi-specialty group. In fact, we're more specialty than than primary care. And I think one of the biggest things is developing robust primary care and clinical pathways that everyone agrees on so that we can actually take patients away from the specialist, get them back to primary care where they belong um, and, and collaborate on that care. And then I think the second piece, because we have access issues with our specialists, is um, what Dr. Hughes mentioned around e-consults. We have a very robust e-consult program. We want to expand that. And so having models where you get reimbursement for that because it's the right thing to do with the patient would help tremendously um, because that is collaboration between primary care and specialists without a patient needing to go somewhere, which I think is incredibly valuable. Well, I, with that, we'll close our panel. Thank you all of you for participating. This is a great discussion. Um, being able to hear from Dr. Hughes, Dr. Mickey, Dr. DeGeneres, and Dr. Froelich, I thank you and, and, and female power in terms of um, today's discussion. It was, it was wonderful. Thank you all. And thank you for joining us.